centrist position. <laughs> now, Shashi, how can I compete with this huge fan audience of yours? But I'm going to try. And this is meant to be a conversation, so I think we both have a go. I mean, I... Um, a little closer, I think. To sorry? Mike, a little closer. Closer? Okay. Um, now, uh, I would like to... I know you want to talk, and I do too, about what the British did and didn't do for us. But I think the question we've been set is, did we really need the Brits? And I'd like to kick off that by saying I probably would agree with you, to your surprise, that I don't that think... That is my surprise. Yes, I don't think we really did need the Brits. But I have to say a big however. I think India, pre-colonial India, was a basket case. The economy was in decline according to all the independent figures, and I can quote you Indian economists, from 1600 onwards, from the end of Akbar's reign onwards. Mughal agriculture was stagnant, was surplus was taken by Jagirdars, there was nothing to reinvest. Indian exports were already declining. Education was non-existent. There were no universities. Uh, schools were in a dreadful state. Read Aparna Basu, the education historian. And uh, so I think on all these indicators, plus the Mughal state had collapsed because of a series of invasions from the Marathas, from Nadir Shah, from Ahmad Shah Abdali. So there was a huge political vacuum which was affecting the economy. So this was the pre-colonial situation in the 1750s. And I have to say that, uh, you know, my criticism of the Brits, apart from their racism, which I would join you in criticizing, is that they didn't do enough. They were not here to transform India. They were not here to modernize India. Whatever they did was incidental initially exactly. to their pr commercial project. And nevertheless, I think they did more good than harm. Now, over to you. No, well, I mean, that's where Zaheer and I disagree. Uh, now, the, the portrait he paints of India in the mid-18th century is not quite the whole story. India was, despite some of these things being correct, that is that agriculture was relatively stagnant and the later Mughals were quite rapacious through their system of tax collections with the Jagidars and so on, but, but India was a sophisticated economy with a significant merchant banking system it is estimated that the Jagat Sits in the 1750s, who helped finance Clive, by the way, actually dealt with more money in the course of the year than the Royal Bank of England. Um, and this is at the time that Zaire is talking about. As to exports going down, depends on which exports. Textiles continue to go up. There's a no, very no, no, substantial no, paper, very substantial paper, which I have, you can find in my, in my end notes, uh, by a research scholar who specializes in precisely this that gives you details of the, of the value of textile exports. Thir so Thankar Roy at the LSE? Exactly. Yeah, he, so, says, he says export, Mughal trade exports were declining before the British arrived. Well, we're, we're going to have to look at the numbers and, 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 and compare them. But there is no doubt that we're talking about a relatively prosperous and complex society with artisans, with weavers, with exporters, merchants, shipbuilders, sword makers, uh, all of these so that not everyone was dependent in any case on the relatively stagnant agriculture and that the agriculture itself did not, for example, involve landless peasantry. People lived on the land that they tilled and, and had a sense of ownership of it, even though they may have had to pay rapacious taxes. And as far as the overall economy was concerned, it may not have been an entirely egalitarian system, but as of 1700, 27% of global GDP, and as late as 1800, 23% of global GDP, citing figures from the Oxford econometric historian Angus Madison. So on that, uh, I, I think also it's have Madison's figures. <laughs> there you are, and, and they they don't add up. I'm afraid to, but they anyway, don't add up the, to the yours. The point I'm trying to make is that to suggest that the Brits came into some sort of basket case country is laughable. 
There is no, absolutely no evidence to sustain uh, that. Can I quote uh, Irfan Habib to you? Would you take his? He says the Mughal Empire was its own grave digger. No new order was or could be created by the forces ranged against it either. And this, you know, is from a, a very reputed historian oh, of, course, of the very Mughal much period. So, but, you know, uh, no new wing. order could have been created is speculative counterfactual history. And I'd say that any one of us can come up with a counterfactual. The Marathas, uh, for example, had made considerable progress. Yes, they got a walloping by Ahmed Shah Abdali at the Third Battle of Pani, but then Abdali went away again. And the Marathas didn't build a single institution, civil, civil society. They levied chauth, which was a form of blackmail, math, uh, protection money. And you're not going to get me on stage attacking the Marathas in Mumbai. His address is available somewhere else. Why, why not? Why not? We are, you know, we are not still under the heel of the ship Sena here. Now, uh, but I, I think, you see, uh, the whole problem with this argument is, let's not get into counterfactuals, let's look at factuals. And the factuals are on all the best economic statistics, and I refer you to Tirthankar Roy, I refer you to D.N. Gardgill, the first chairman of one of the planning, uh, uh, chairman of our planning commission, which suggests that Indian manufacturers did not suffer significantly under the British. There was a slight dip in the 1820s. They picked up with cheap yarn, etc. By the 1850s, we were competing with Lancashire. By 1947, we had the world's fourth largest textile industry supplying 78% of India's textile needs. These are all there, you know. Yes, indeed. But the fact is that the the high quality textile industry the British destroyed was destroyed. There are st statistics, for example, showing that Murshidabad and Dhaka became the first cities in the modern world to be actually depopulated. They lost population. Centers and moved. the weavers thrown out of work were then flung into farms which could not support them. Why creating would the East a India Company throw workers, out, weavers out of work? They need, the East India Company was here to export Indian textiles to Britain, right? They were not Lancashire mill owners. Why would they be uh, putting weavers out of work? They, were wanted, they wanted weavers. Well, I, sh I, sh I should think that what they wanted to do was to sell whatever goods they were bringing into India. They were not bringing uh, into any cloth into India. And they, they did. Never, uh, oh, of course they no, did. No, 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 they were not. The cloth, import, really? cloth import started in the 1820s, 1820, yes. and it was not, they were manufactured by Lancashire mills, which had nothing to do with the East India Company. The East India Company didn't East, manufacture goods. The East India Company was a trading company, but there were, obviously there was a bias towards trading for the British. I mean, let's face it, for example, if you take something like the shipbuilding business. What happens is the Indians are making these wonderful ships, essentially using teak and mahogany, which lasted longer than fir and pine, which is what European ships were made of. The average European ship didn't last much longer than six or seven years. The average Indian ship lasted a good 24, 25 years. So when the East India Company establishes its dominance over the ports, the Brits say, hey, great, let's make ships in India. Better for us, so the British companies come and they start making ships in India. And there's wonderful accounts, some of which I've quoted, of the high quality of Indian craftsmanship, not just the woodwork with the brass and fixtures and fittings and so on. What's the consequence? It throws people out of work in London. Shipwrights, plowrights, uh, uh, the dockyard workers, unemployed. Now, the East India Company may not be in the shipping business, but when this happens, what happens? The British Parliament passes a law that makes it impossible for ships made in India to ply the lucrative route to England. Promptly, shipbuilding in India collapses because nobody is able to make ships in India anymore, and Indian ships are essentially confined to the very, very small coastal trade between small Indian ports. In other words, the dice were constantly stacked against India. When Zari talks about things uh, like... I, I, sorry, Shash, I have to come in there. Because you say the dac dice were constantly s uh, stacked. I would agree with you about the 1840s and 50s. However, from... No, no, the law I'm talking uh, about was 1814. Uh, 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 no, no. Soon after the Napoleonic yeah. Wars, yeah. 1817. Yes, okay. Yeah. But by the time you got to the 20th century, there was tariff protection for Indian industries, which Indian textile... Oh, come on, the destruction of the attempt uh, uh, by Chidambara Pillai to start a shipping well, line is well documented. No, no. I 
I the British okay. had no desire to see an Indian company in the shipping business. They drove him out of business. Well, I have and, to, and he ended up for a fellow. I don't have yes. the statistics on shipping. However, I do have the statistics on textiles, which is one of the big examples you give in your book of de-industrialization. De de Absolutely. And I think there is no doubt that once the cotton mill started in Bombay with British capital and technical assistance, they grew rapidly. They were supplying 8% of this the This is domestic, much later, Zeri. Uh, sorry? This is much later. Yes. And because I, why? The Brits wanted cheaper Indian labor. You paid them less than you paid the guys in Lancashire. It's as Look, simple as that. It's uh, not a virtue. There is, uh, I again refer you to Tirthankar Roy, uh, who is one, the leading economic historian of this period. He's at the LSE. He's an Indian. He's a Bengali. Now, his view is that there is no question that through the early uh, British period in India, there, was, there were winners and losers, but because cheap yarn actually helped weavers, it didn't help spinners in the long, but in the long run, he argues that textile prices came down, there was more demand for textiles, per capita consumption of textiles went up, this is in the 1820s and 30s, and it, there was more demand for the products of weavers. So, by the time you get to 1947, there were as many weavers in India as there were in 1757. By, 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 no, by 1947, the fact that Indians had, in fact, established textile companies, not just in Bombay, Ahmedabad, and so on, is absolutely documented. But as I say, no, this I'm, is... I'm talking of handlooms. The handloom sector, in absolute terms, was as big as independent, at independence as it was when but the British took over. You still can't deny the fact that it, it went through a terrible dip between roughly the 1760s, 1770s, the incident well, that Robert Bolt's the Dutch uh, observer, recorded of the weaver's thumbs being cut off. Yes, is I, I want to. I'm glad you I brought know. that up. I want to take you up on that because I, I know. I know the no, British no, keep saying no, it never no, happened, no, but I no, have an account. No, it's not the British. I have taken the trouble, having seen that in your book, to get William Bolt's book out of the London Library. It's a wonderful 18th century book. It was written by a Dutch trader right. who was expelled by the East India Company for black marketing diamonds. He then wrote this monograph of every kind of rumor and allegation he could find. And even his book only says this was a rumor. That, and he doesn't say that the British cut off anyone's thumbs or broke them, as you claim in your book. He says, weavers cut off their own thumbs. No, which no, is, no. Which is, yes, I, I assure you, that, Shashi, on oath, that I have been to the... Have you looked at the source? Yes. No, well, absolutely. I suggest well, you go back to Well, it. I haven't gone back to the Huntington Library in England or whatever, no. but I have actually seen a reprint of this, and that's not what it says. I will all right, but, all right, uh, so, and, but it's even more improbable. Why would... Just ask yourself, why okay. would Indian Thank weavers... You cut off or break their thumbs rather than work for the British who were paying, the, if they were pay, being paid what uh, so, so the going why, rate. Why, why did these poor weavers lose their jobs? Why did they leave the sheet of other They were more we It was spinners who lost their job. You know, and the statistics, all the best statistics, let us be clear, yours and mine, are guesstimates because there were no censuses done. There were no, these are what, what economists call qualitative uh, statistics, not quantitative statistics, as no, you but know. Some statistics were kept. For example, the British kept rather meticulous amounts, accounts of the amounts of money they sent back to England each year. Yes. And, and that's we'll documented that. and it's there. And we'll, Let's agree yeah, to yeah. disagree on textiles and move okay. on because otherwise we'll have an entire okay. conversation for okay. that and not about. <laughs> did you want to move on? Did you want to move on to the so-called drain theory? Yes, certainly. Okay. Dada by Naroji has yes. started the, the documentation of that. Yeah. And I'm sure you've read Digby's numbers. Yes. And Dada by Naroji you was... You see how well prepared well, Zarina has come with all his numbers on his uh, laptop. Was, uh, and I have well, to trust well, my poor uh, political memory. So, someone has to rather than rely just on emotions. And I think the point about the drain theory is if you look at the inward investment that came in from Britain, it was 312 billion pounds in 1913. 
the interest payments on that would have worked out at 3.5% or 4%, which was the global rate of interest, would have been far above Where do you get the these numbers remittances. From, the numbers, because uh, Shashi... Un what unlike, did they bring money in to invest? Uh, Where is the evidence in, of their investment? Uh, there was huge investment coming in. You don't look at it. There was a lot of investment there coming wasn't. in. Well, uh, <laughs> there wasn't. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, the fact is not only that the British extracted taxation at a rapacious rate, far worse than the Mughals, and no, that they no, sent it all back absolutely to Absolutely wrong there. Absolutely. Uh, okay. even, even the worst, <laughs> the worst and most oppressive no, local no, rajas no. built bridges and sarais and roads, the Brits didn't. This is all documented in British no, accounts, no, no, no. and I've it's not. cited many of them, but I've also read extensively, till my eyes started blurring, accounts of the British flagellating themselves about their failure to do these things. There are books available published in the late 18th okay. and early can 19th I, century. Can, sorry, can but I? Let me, let, me, no, let me briefly finish, finish the, the counter riposte to what you just said. Uh, not only did the British... Not, not only did the British... <laughs> yeah, you must follow Zari's advice. <laughs> More emotion, so, less facts. <laughs> so, we have an so, intelligent so, audience. So not only, not only did, um, I, do I find absolutely no evidence for any significant British investment in India, but for example, it is a documented fact that India was the principal contributor, for example, to the British war effort in the First World War. At exactly the time that Zareed is talking about, the yeah. British weren't sending money to India, they were extracting money from India. No, that's From not the true. Indian taxpayer, uh, have you, from the Treasury. Have you looked at Absolutely, the, uh, I've looked at Have you all. looked at the fact of, of what the government of India was getting for the service of Indian troops abroad? Do you know that in 1947, India was left with 37 billion pounds of foreign reserves, which were payment for the services of Indian troops abroad in World War II. I don't have the figure for World War I. I do have the figure but, for World uh, War I. Look them up in my book. Okay, but can I just take you up on the tax system? Because I am quoting Madison, whom you quoted earlier. He says, the British inherited the Mughal tax system, which provided a land revenue capital equal to 15% of national income. By the end of the colonial period, land tax was reduced to only 1% of national income. Mughal land tax was about 30% of the crop, but by 1947, land tax was only 2% of agricultural income. You're talking 1947, I'm talking about the 1770s. Well, I'm talking about the 1780s. I have documentation of taxes being as high as 85 and 90% of the crop. Well, P.J. Marshall, evidence. whom you quote in your book, mm -hmm. says the opposite. He says the British were very conservative. They kept the Mughal it depends depends land, and land and revenue taxes. No, there were large chunks of Bengal for example, we have evidence of peasants actually fleeing company controlled lands for lands still ruled by Indian princes because they were more humane. And what was the evidence? It's, it's, it's the, the numbers of people moving. That's the and evidence. Where do you get that from? From documents I read from that period. Some of which, by the way, were submitted to the House of Commons in testimony as well. And I don't just mean the Burke impeachment uh, speech against Hastings, I actually mean hearings in the House of Commons both in the 1780s and 90s, but as late as the 1840s. There's some startling testimony by former British civil servants about the way in which Britain was running the Indian Empire, given to British legislators, MPs listening to them, which is truly damning. And again, I've quoted some of it, but for every bit I've quoted, there are 10 things more equally damning uh, about the way in which the British conducted themselves. I think does these does that not say it? something for the self-critical faculties of British oh, officials? And I mean, I think since we're not going to agree on the economy, and neither of us has the economist we want here <laughs> to back Angus Madison is in the grave uh, alas, let, Let's uh, move on to, shall we move on to political, educational, more institutional things? Yes. Now, yes. on the political side, can you question the fact that the British did introduce, however belatedly, they introduced municipal self-government from the 1860s, they introduced provincial autonomy from 1937 with one-sixth of the adult population voting. And uh, how late was that by comparison with what they gave to the so-called white commonwealth? 
I'm not. No, I, mean, I, I said at the is, beginning there was racism. There was total I, racism. There was also the problems of a largely illiterate society, and I think oh, we're, we're come on. That's to, not the point. You're not looking at empowering. You're not making an illiterate peasant into the the governor or the municipal mayor. You're looking at example after example of educated, qualified Indians who were discriminated against, denied opportunity. One, when they were reluctantly admitted to the service, they were drummed out of it, they were denied serious positions, and I've gone into this in some detail. And again, yeah. the British condemned themselves in their own march. You've got Lord Lytton, Queen Victoria's favorite poet, Robert Bulbo Lytton, Viceroy of India at her own request, writing to her saying, you know, we've seen your proclamation in which you say you want to associate Indians with governance, and of course we are following this and hiring some Indians. But you do realize, don't you, that we can't give them any real authority. And these are people who are, in many respects, far more qualified than the mediocre Englishmen who are given real authority, but, but who happen to be white. Uh, Shashi, you, 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 there's simply no excuse for this. No, no, I quite agree. And I said at the beginning that I thought one of the blemishes on the Raj and a major blemish. But it infects everything. It see. did, and it, it led infects. to an independence movement which, uh, which reversed that. There was, however, I think you will accept, a process of Indianization which began after World War I, both of the armed forces and of the ICS. And why? The because at World War I, yeah. the, sudden, the, the, the surplus population of available young men to run the empire got killed in the trenches of France and Europe, that and suddenly they needed to actually associate non-whites with the process of government. Yeah. If the British hadn't lost so many available young men, in the First World War, they'd have continued ruling India as oppressively and as racist a way as they had done for the preceding I, century. I think that's a very cynical view because I it think... It is a cynical you know, view because the experience of British rule breeds cynicism. Again, again, you can't prove a counterfactual and I can't prove you wrong on that. It's hypothetical. The fact is they did introduce Indianization. They had they no choice. They did introduce democratization. And what did they do there, at the end of the First there, World War? They introduced there, the Rowlett Act. There was they introduced the repressive Rowlett Act in which they're actually having broken their promise to give Indians responsible self-government in return for their support in the First World War. They introduced the repressive Rowlett Acts, restricted assembly, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, everything, arrested people, cut down on demonstrations, all of that, and the Jallianwala Bagh massacre followed. So you cannot tell me that associating Indians after the First World War was what the Brits did. Uh, look, I mean, Jallianwala Bagh involved uh, maybe, is it 400 people killed and... No, no, no. Uh, well, 1379. Come on, oh, don't give me okay. this. Okay, well, uh, Shashi, you have your own sources and your own figures. I'm not no, going to... No, there's a detailed commission of inquiry <laughs> no, conducted no, that story, No, the inquiry produced, I think, was... That was, that was the Hunter Commission gave you 400. Yeah. The Congress Party's okay. inquiry but, but, named the 1379 but, but I, people. I think, I think it was appalling. I it think was. the British have apologized for it. I think it no, was... No, they haven't apologized okay. for it. But, they have never okay, apologized. But, but, and they should. I have demanded in Britain that Britain should take the opportunity of the centenary. And the centenary of the massacre comes up on the 13th of April 2019. And, and, and I hope that by then we will have an apology and, from somebody in a responsible position. And will the Congress party apologize for how many thousands killed in Kashmir, it's, for 100,000 Muslims killed in invasion of Hyderabad? Uh, well, I, I think how, that how many, a hundred, according to Saeed Naqvi, a hundred thousand Muslims killed in Nehru's invasion of Hyderabad. Are you going to apologize for that? No, because there yes. was, that, that was a war. Jalem was a, a massacre. A war, a war. The Razakars were armed to the teeth. And they were, I'm sorry, that, and, that was and a And Kashmir military wasn't a war. Kashmir was a walkover, was it? <laughs> I didn't no. say Kashmir wasn't. Uh, no. I, did I say Kashmir is a walkover? But, did somebody look, hear me say uh, that? But, but look, can yeah, we go I, to something sorry, a bit no, more my structural? Point is, the, my is point is, take, the, ru take is the rule of law. When the British arrived, a Brahmin could not face the death penalty if he killed a Shudra. A Shudra was facing the death penalty if he cohabited with an upper caste woman. At least give the British the credit for introducing equality before the law and not recognizing caste as having different status under the law. Oh, well, let me stress the one major caste that the British did recognize was the caste that they belonged to. The rule of law was implemented with excessive deference to the skin color of the defendant. So in 200 years of British rule, there are only three cases in which Englishmen were convicted for murdering Indians, while thousands of Indians were actually killed. 
whereas any Indian who so much as raised his hand against an English person was liable to being hanged, to being blown from the mouth of a cannon, or the mildest punish was being transported off to the Andamans. So don't tell me about the rule of law in Britain, uh, in British India. Indian judges were not allowed to try English defendants in most parts. Uh, in fact, when the Ilbert Bill was passed, the poor Viceroy Ripon, the one non-racist Viceroy we had, was drummed out of office and driven that back. That was oh. in the 1880s. Yes, the British were there for another half century. Yes, but for another half century, the practice <laughs> continued. No, it I have quoted didn't, an didn't, incident didn't, from 1926 of this kind of racist thing. The British evolved this entire theory of the so-called Indian spleen, Look, uh, which uh, is that Shashi. all Indians were malarial, they had enlarged spleens, so when an Englishman kicked an Indian to death by kicking him in the stomach, it wasn't the kicker's fault, it was the fault of the ruptured spleen. That was spleen. one case, yes, and no, it's much worse. No, not one case, but I'm sorry, I, there were can, literally But can I give you the example of thousands? Don't talk to me about rule can of law. Can I give you the law example law of thousands of civil disobedience resistors in the Congress? My father was one of them, spent four years in jail who did not get kicked, who were treated as, my, as my, in my father's words, officers and gentlemen. They were kept in political prisons. They were allowed to have political meetings, get literature in. They p constructed socialist and communist cells and came out and founded socialist and communist parties. All this was tolerated and indeed, um, you know, often encouraged by British officials. Yeah. So is there encouraged. anything positive you feel in the legacy or is, you know, because surely, you know, what, one thing that history teaches us and, uh, you know, is that nothing is ever totally black and white. That's and right. and it, there has to be a bit more than cricket and PG Woodhouse, which is all you seem to acknowledge. All I acknowledge, exactly. Uh, and, and your language, <laughs> and your language. So, so. You know, uh, Zari, the fact is that uh, I do quote a lovely letter mm -hmm. by Jawaharlal Nehru to Lord Lothian, responding to precisely the argument you make, in which he points out not just the daily humiliations that Indians were subject to, including Indians like Zareel's father and like Nehru himself. Uh, but, as he, as he says, essentially the fundamental lack of self-respect. There is, in fact, a, 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 a serious question as to what, how do you weigh these things in the balance. There was, in fact, uh, another anecdote I recount quite separately about uh, the visit of Edward, the man who briefly became Edward VIII later as Prince of Wales to India, who. Uh, spoke to the Indian official accompanying him and pointed to a number of what he saw as wonderful things, you know, buildings and, and trains and so on and so forth. And he said, so we've given you all of this, you know, what, what, what is lacking here? Whereupon uh, uh, the Indian official responds, self-respect, your majesty or whatever, your highness. And that is the key issue. I mean, the and, ultimate and it thing came, is that... And it uh, came sir, peacefully. It came through peaceful sir, evolution. I'm very sorry okay. to interrupt, but we are just left with 10 minutes. Would you okay. like to go with the Q&A session? So, yeah, let's uh, get some questions. open it up. Uh, the lady in front we here. We just have 10 minutes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, please calm down. We'll, do, we'll try to do the best. Please calm down. I think you better decide whether we take questions or not. No. Okay. All right, carry on. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we, we, we carry on. Uh, Shashi, well, I want to come on to something like education because we, we touched on language. Um, you know, I, Zaria, I, think, I, ga I gather you've given a, an entire talk on the subject of British education in okay. India. And I know you think there wasn't any, but... <laughs> there was very little of it. It was very, very little. <laughs> but... Um, the entire... But in I'm, 1930, I'm, the entire uh, education budget of British India, at all levels, from kindergarten to university, put together, amounted to a little over half of that of the high school budget of the state of New York. This is according to Will Durant, the American historian who was traveling here at that time. Yes, the Brits and Will no Durant... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. on Will Durant, whom you use in your book, is not considered a historian by any historian I know. Well, he, was, he wrote for coffee, ta coffee table books for society women in Bombay in the 1950s. He was virulently anti-British, and no one else, good uh, no one other than you, quotes him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted to quote him because I think his his information is considerably well substantiated, and this kind of figure can easily be verified. I quote him. 
I didn't go and look up the high school budget of the state of New York. But the fact is the Brits had no real interest in educating Indians. They weren't particularly keen on spending money for the well-being of Indians. Macaulay made it clear, Zareer has written an entire biography of the man, that the interest was in creating a class of Indians uh, what was it, English, uh, Indians in blood and color, but English in taste and opinions and, and can morals I, and can intellect. I, can I quote, and the purpose of can those I people quote, was, yeah. was and to can serve I quote, as interpreters between the British and the people no, of the No, government. no, 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 can I quote Macaulay's next sentence, which people like you ignore? To that class, we may leave it to refine the vernacular dialects of the country to enrich those dialects with terms of science taken from the Western nomenclature and to render them by degrees fit vehicles for carrying knowledge to the great mass of the population. And if you read Macaulay's other writings, he saw India's moving towards self-government, admittedly through Western education filtering down, and the filtration theory didn't work, and it was reversed under Curzon and people like that who said it wasn't working. But I think, you know, on the figures, I have to tell you that uh, literacy, you know, and this was an argument Gandhi had with Sir Philip Hartog, a British educationist. And Gandhi made a speech at Chatham House, um, similar to yours, sort of uh, excoriating everything in the Raj, and he said literacy has declined, and Philip Hartog sent the census figures to him from 1880 onwards, showing not spectacular, but steady increase. And if you look, male literacy went from 8% 8, 8 in, 18, in 1881 to 30% in 1947. Female literacy went from virtually zero to 9% in 47. Very, very poor. But, you know, it, it took India two, till 2009 to create free and compulsory primary education. So we can't blame the British for failing to do that. Yes, they were a laissez-faire state. They didn't they try. Didn't, they didn't, but neither d has, did no, India in, till India two, did. India 2009. Did much larger numbers of people. The Brits at the peak only had 300 million Indians to contend with as late as the 1940s, and still they didn't spend the money that would have been required to educate them. Now, I think it's very difficult to put lipstick on this particular pig. I mean, this is, this is really uh, a, a policy that systematically spent the least conceivable amount of money for the welfare of Indians, where every institution and every single contribution the British made was actually directed towards enhancing British profit, perpetuating British control, and promoting British interests. But if and you, Indians if you were accept, totally irrelevant okay. to the enterprise, except that we happen to be here. Okay. If you accept the Madison figures, they show that India had a more or less steady growth, rate of growth under the Raj, with a slight dip in the 1820s, of 1.5%. That was the average. And from yeah. 1900 uh, to it, 1947? It, it was, was 0.01%. Yeah, because there happened to be a world recession. But I'm saying the average rate over the entire period was uh, 1.5%, uh, corrected for population growth. That was the rate of growth under Nehru's government, and it was till 1980. 1.5% people used to call it the Hindu rate of growth. Three, actually, so, but still... Yeah, no, I'm no, not, not corrected for population. Three, without population growth. 1.5% allowing for population. So I really think you have to see this in the context of what came before and what came after. You know, and I think uh, we, we have to agree to disagree because I think there was some progress. It was not as great as should, it should have been. It certainly, you know, was filling a political vacuum which might have resulted in several states emerging. And if you compare India's performance with China's over the same period, and China did not have colonial rule, at least not in any indirect sense, um, you know, China's performance was much worse. China's industrial output fell by 10% by 1913. You know, and then they had civil wars, and then they had Mao. Yeah, they they and, had a know, different history at that time, and they yeah. did have, the country was, was divided, fragmented, warlordism. They yeah. did have large chunks of the country. Which was happening in India. Captured by the, captured by the colonialists as well. I mean, Beijing was well, essentially divided amongst half a dozen colonial powers, so were large chunks of the south. So it's a different story, and I don't think we should compare China to India. Well, as far as Indian growth is concerned, I will take this precise argument you made about 1900 and 1947 when you said there was a recession. Fair enough, there was a recession for part of that time from about 1929 
to about 1938. Yeah, right the fact right still is... Right through from the end of World War I, but, a, a global but, but, trade but, was declining. I know, my dear boy, just take the entire 47 years and tell me what the British rate of growth was, tell me what the American rate of growth was. How is it that other countries could grow, but thanks to the tender mercies of British rule, well, India didn't grow? No. I mean, the fact Acor is... According to Madison, it grew by 1.5%, no, no. which, which was in line... 0.01%. No, 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 that's you not... Can check, those you can, are not Madison's figures, I'm sorry. You can and, check the numbers. <laughs> Correct them for I population will, growth, and that's what um, you'll find. No, no. So, no 1.5% per capita income increase, not the, you know, GDP increase, which I'm is... I'm talking yeah. GDP, because that's the, the overall number yeah, one can GDP find. The divided is, by population the, gives you the, per capita. The point is, I am arguing that the Brits ruled India in the interests of Britain, not in the interests of Indians. And I think that case you have not refused. When you say the Brits, you're c uh, clubbing together a lot of people, some of whom were very idealistic. If you read their I, private I, I papers, you read their diaries, people like Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who was responsible for Elphinstone College. Well, he was also responsible for the divide and rule theory. So, uh, with you, mean, you know, this it's, divide it's, and rule theory, which you feast on, Shashi, there is not a single jot of evidence for it anywhere. Give me a single quotation. Elphinstone's <laughs> own memorandum, yes. 1858, Divide et impera was the ancient Roman maxim, and it shall be ours, quote, unquote. And which Elphinstone are you referring to? Not Mount Stuart Elphinstone. Well, the he Elphinstone was, he, was uh, around. Mount Stuart Elphinstone was here in the 1820s. 1858, in there the was, there immediate... There was an Elphinstone in, okay, in the Bombay in, presidency. Yes, 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 there was a Lord Elphinstone who That's was right. a descendant who was governor of Bombay. That's the one I'm he, referring to. No one took him very seriously. Oh, come on. No, he was not. <laughs> And, so, and the real technique is and, anybody I agree with is taken no, seriously. No, no, no. Anybody I don't like is not taken seriously. Context, serious. context. <laughs> he was talking in the immediate context of the, mu mutiny, of the mutiny or absolutely. the war of independence Very or whatever. Much. When the British had a tremendous, for a few years, it didn't last more than a decade. There was a decade of feeling, in, uh, you know, they had to entrench themselves. They were about to be driven out. They became very defensive. But there is no evidence oh, that... Oh, it continues. I mean, look at the partition of Bengal. It was deliberately and consciously conceived as a ploy to divide Hindus and Muslims. It was projected as such. Well, there are speeches by the Lieutenant Governor, Bamfil Fuller, saying that, of the, of the, that the entire purpose of this was to give Mohammedans control over their own territory in East Bengal for the first time, and how between his two wives, Hindu and Muslim, he preferred the Muslim. All of this talk was deliberate. The classic story of the Nawab of Dhaka, Oxonian, who uh, told about the plan to partition Bengal, says, this is a beastly idea, I shan't stand for it. And the Brits quietly slip him 100,000 pounds, and suddenly he sings a different tune. No, you, this is the way in which the Brits consciously pursued divide and rule. But, Shashi, then you have to also give them credit for reversing the partition of Bengal, which they did under in a few... massive uh, protest uh, for three well, years. Uh, under pro made, which under made protest. the place ungovernable. So, so they listened to protest, which is something, you know, our, our, our independence... You asked me to demonstrate <laughs> proof that there was divide uh, and rule. Yeah, I no. gave you proof, another said there was, but they reversed it. It wasn't, it wasn't the dominant policy. Let's put it, it that was, way. It was very, and very much deliberate, minuted policy. Check, check, check. Anyway, I mean, the, the, I, uh, the, 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 the partition of well, Bengal... Partition of Bengal, no, fact, no Bengali I know would the, like to reverse it, either in... Oh, Bang, at that Bang, time Bang, they did, No, no, it? but not, uh, not at, in 1947, unfortunately, and not now. So you have to accept that there were some structural differences between what... Uh, you know, Muslim elites wanted and what Hindu elites and wanted. And who, who encouraged these divisions as a well, matter of policy? You say, you know, but there were many Mont examples I can give you where the British brought them together and said, you must knock heads, you must work together, you must cooperate. After uh, they'd done all the damage in the first well, place. <laughs> no, I mean, and the British essentially helped create the Muslim League and then to say 30 years later, uh, you know, you should cooperate is a bit, is a bit hypocritical. I think you mind. really have very little respect for Muslims. Oh if, you, dear. if you think, if you think that the British, 
if you think the British, my BJP critics say uh, this, the right? British <laughs> created the Muslim League, uh, you know, this, this argument you know, is very uh, totally offensive to a lot of Muslims I know because you treat them as children who were manipulated no. by the British. You don't accept that there were escalating communal tensions in a system where democracy was being introduced and people were contesting elections. And as, we, as happens now, increasingly trying to win votes on religious platforms. So when people contest elections, the British decide deliberately to create electorates on communal lines. The British no. say... No, that, you know, the British didn't I'm decide sorry, this. Would they in London the have Muslims said that the Jews of Golders Green no. could only vote for Jews? No. I'm sorry. You, they but you're wrong. They didn't say... And you know, you, I've come back on... You. This example you give is totally wrong because it suggests that Muslims were only allowed to vote for Muslims. What you ignore is that Muslims demanded and got a small proportion, it was a small proportion, of reserved seats in which Muslims only voted for Muslims. The vast majority of general seats were open to everyone, including Muslims, to vote in, and Muslim candidates and voters you know, ran in those seats. So this, the argument that the British created these separate electorates, the Muslims demanded it, it was a guarantee of a certain minimum representation. If they were not stopped from voting in general seats, no, and they did. They, they were not stopped from voting in general seats. In other words, they were allowed, but the whole idea of creating the separate seats was to foment a consciousness that your interests were best protected through your religious identification. And Muslims, Look, Muslims it, had right no say in that. Right up to the 1920s. Had no, Sayyid, Sayyid Ahmed Khan had no say in that. The, uh, 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 right uh, up to the 1920s, there were Muslims who simultaneously, in one case in the same year, presided over the Indian National Congress and presided over the Muslim League. In other words, they saw no incompatibility between the overall goals of the Indian National Congress. Provided they had their reserved separate electorates. That was on that basis. It was agreed by the Congress. The Congress Muslim League it a, Pact It was agreed, agreed the Lucknow Pact yeah. in 1916, but the fact yeah. is that by that point it became inevitable. From the Minto Mori reforms onwards, these wretched separate constituencies were created. You know, you can create a constituency and encourage people to think differently along those lines because unfortunately that is the way in which human beings are willing to take whatever opportunities are given along the ways that you can. In India, for example, the adoption of the Mandal Commission report by VP Singh's government created an incredible consciousness of the OBC community, of themselves as a community entitled certain rights and privileges, and now you've got other communities, the Patels in Gujarat, the Jats in Haryana, the Marathas here, wanting to be classified as OBC. So, but are that you going to say that... It's different from, no, it's a, 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 from a pro some protection I don't think of that minority were... rights. So, in, I think in, in 1857, I, when I, the Muslims and the Hindus fought side by side, under the, uh, the, the banner of the poor and feeble Mughal emperor to overthrow the Brits, was there no co separate religious consciousness? It, it's such they a loaded... Were the Muslims and the Hindus, there was... Uh, the, uh, 1857 was dispossessed yeah, elites. Yeah. Some the Hindu, soldiers, some Muslims, boys. the Nana Sahib, the, you know, the, the poor Mughal emperor wheeled out against his will. There was no question of a Hindu-Muslim... All I'm saying is it did not... There was absolutely no credible evidence that there was a separate, distinct Muslim consciousness versus Hindu consciousness politically until the British fought. No, I have to totally disagree with you on that. And Gentlemen, I think most um, Muslims, most Muslims that I know would, and you know, had that, if your view, it had it not been for your majoritarian view, we might not have had partition because unfortunately your view was also the view of Nehru, Patel and Gandhi who made it impossible to have a compromise with Jinnah. No, the compromise well, which the British Jinnah would wanted, have loved. The compromise that Jinnah wanted that Zeri is implying, I think he's referring to, was the cabinet mission plan under which Jinnah would have retained the right to secede 10 years later anyway. So obviously, there was no interest in agreeing to a plan that would have permitted well, might have not been just better a than partition, doing it in but a far worse partition in which larger chunks of India would have had to secede. Why? So that's a because the have, provinces, have had to be the provinces of, yes, no, there were the whole of Punjab, still, all of Bengal, all of Hyderabad, all grouped in these provinces. So, no, we, we can discuss this, unfortunately, at another time. I'm really sorry that I have a flight to catch. I have Parliament in Delhi tomorrow morning, so I won't be able to stay to sign books tonight. Thank you for being a great audience. Thanks, Zareer, for being such a good duelist, <laughs> though I still disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs>
and apologies for abandoning you at this time. Thank you.